were in Portland, Oregon last week, marrying a couple friends last Sunday morning. Uh, one of the most beautiful venues I've ever experienced. Uh, they married in a small uh, grove of redwood trees, a uh, beautiful redwood deck, and it was just gorgeous. Uh, good to be back. So this morning, um, we are in Hebrews chapter 12, and uh, We'll go through verses 12 through 24. So a little tip for you life group people, uh, you can pick it up at verse 25 and finish the chapter for your study this coming week, all right? Uh, Josiah? I was promised you would I know, I know. We're, you know. <laughs> so here we are. Uh, let's just read uh, Hebrews 12, 18 to 24. We'll see what the Lord has for us. It's good. I can tell you right now, it's really good. It's really encouraging, these verses of Scripture. Hebrews 12, 18, For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire, and to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure what was commanded saying, and it said, and if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. Contrast now, verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels of the festal gathering and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. So uh, we're going to break this down this morning. It's a very encouraging message. I just want to tell you. Um, the theme that the writer has been using to encourage us is the theme of an endurance race, right? I know Pastor Randy last week uh, really stressed that word endurance, and I'm stressing it to you again. In fact, we're stressing it again for the fourth or fifth time. The sermon series has become an endurance sermon series. We are just keep enduring in the sermon. But uh, that's what the author is saying. And what we've learned so far is that uh, this uh, analogy of a race is a descriptive of the Christian life, that it's, it's a long process that is begun at salvation and ends when we go to heaven, right? At death or rapture of the church. And uh, in between the beginning and the end, that's wrought with all kinds of challenges that are normal to all people in life, but unique also as Christians because we're living in a different world while we're living in this world. We have a different worldview. Uh, as Jesus famously said, praying for his disciples, I've taken them, they are not of the world, but I've separated from the world, right? So we're not segregated. We live among our fellow man, but we are separated by virtue of being Christians. And that's all by design. But with that comes a whole bunch of challenges that are unique to Christianity. As these saints that receive this letter were experiencing that in a very real way, in that they were being persecuted for their faith. They were suffering for their faith. And that was causing them to want to stop running the race. And so the author writes, and he encourages through the testimony of a whole bunch of great cloud of witnesses at the end of chapter 11, as he referred to Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Moses and on and on and on. And he just said, look, these people also endured great conflict, but they finished well. And so the author is encouraging us to keep our eyes on Jesus and, and to believe continuously in his faithfulness to us, which inspires us to be faithful to him. And so, 
He's also told us that uh, part of the suffering, the suffering that we're enduring, as he said to us earlier in this chapter, God uses it for, in a refining aspect. The, the, the difficulties, the challenges that we experience, many times interpersonally, uh, it can be in a variety of ways, uh, but God uses those things in a refining way. Um, in that it exposes our, our natural man to ourself, and we find sinful tendencies. And God's, you know, he uses those challenges to, to work that out of us as we confess and receive more grace to keep taking another step in the race, right? Elizabeth Elliot famously said, just do the next right thing. That's how you keep progressing <clears throat> excuse me, in the Christian race. Just do the next thing. And listen, for somebody who is in a serious bout of depression and is struggling to face the day, maybe the next right thing is just simply get out of bed. I just need to put my foot on the floor and actually stand up and then to do the next thing. Right? Brush your teeth, please. Right? And change your clothes, and then on you go through the day. And it can be just as deliberate and exhausting as that. But that's where we grow. And the Lord uses all these challenges. So now we've come to a portion of Scripture that is beautiful because in any endurance race, in any race, you need an incentive. That's how I see it. You need to know what's at the end. When I finally cross that finish line, what, what happens then? Right? Um, and I, you know, I've traveled somewhat occasionally, and there was a period of time I was overseas, and I don't know, 10 days, two weeks, and I'll tell you, the incentive of coming home was I wanted to eat a hamburger again. Right? It's like, I just can't wait. I don't like hotel or airport food, but I don't care. I'm going to the airport, and I'm going to find a hamburger. Because I just was exhausted from the strange diet where we were living for a little bit there. And so the author brings incentive for our endurance. Um, I want to talk about that a lot with you today. And uh, I'm going to back up. You know, Pastor Andy, last week... <clears throat> dipped into Hebrews and, and started in Hebrews to build his study of endurance, and he used Jeremiah as the example. I want to reverse engineer that today and start with Jeremiah to enforce endurance. For there was a period of time in Jeremiah's life, it was in Jeremiah 32, where uh, Jerusalem had been surrounded by the enemy and besieged, and the, all the resources were running dry, and the king of Israel, who lived in Jerusalem, hated Jeremiah because Jeremiah kept telling him, this is not going to go well. You're going to lose. You're going to go into captivity. And the king hated Jeremiah so much that he gagged him. <laughs> not literally, but a gag rule. He put him in prison. And he says, I don't want to hear this anymore. Right? Even though this was the Lord's word through his prophet. And it's so cool because while Jeremiah is in prison, he gets a vision. The Lord says to him, your uncle is going to come to you and he's going to ask you to buy a piece of property in your hometown. Now, any people in the investment world, you just know, you don't buy property for something that's going to end up in ruins. It's like, you just don't do that. And yet the Lord came and, and said to him, your uncle's going to come and he's going to say, buy that property. And sure enough, his uncle showed up and said, I want you to buy a piece of property. And Jeremiah, then the Lord gave him the understanding of what that meant. And what it meant was, yep, you're going to lose this war, and you're going to go into captivity, but my people will come back. And they will plant vineyards, and they'll plant orchards, and they'll plow the soil, and they'll come back to the promised land. And so it was just a a little thing that encouraged Jeremiah while he was in prison. We need incentive, and I believe that's what the Lord is talking about here as he speaks through 
this man. It's the incentive that was before Jesus himself. If you flip back to chapter, well, in chapter 12, back to verse 2, you look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for the joy that was set before him. For the joy that was set before him. That's how he was able to endure the cross and experience the shame and humiliation. It was what was incentivized him to go through the most extreme condition, right, in human experience. And it's basically what incentivized the prodigal son, if you're familiar with that story that Jesus told. The prodigal had, had gone off and sown his oats and run out of money and destroyed his life. But while he's in that place of brokenness, he remembered his father. And he said, you know what, if I go back to my dad's home... My dad is, is gracious and generous. And he said, and sure enough, and it came to pass. And so the son repented and he went back home. And the father, sure enough, he said, let's have a feast and celebrate. For my son was dead, it is alive again. He is found. And they began to celebrate. Okay? So that's what I want to preach to you this morning. That there, there is a good end for us, and hopefully it will encourage us to continue on in the faith. So verse 18, we'll just look at the two different uh, mountains that are referred to here, Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. The first one is Mount Sinai, uh, and the first word of verse 18 says for, and I've said this often, I'll say it again, and it's helpful in your Bible study, in your study of the Bible that the word for is a wonderful word because it's telling us a reason for something. It's because, all right? So the author is giving an additional reason for enduring, and he does it by virtue of contrast and comparison. We have Sinai versus Zion. Both are real. Both are real. And both are in existence as we sit here today. One is on earth, and the other is in heaven. One is physical, one is spiritual and physical. So you can go to wherever Sinai is, and I'm not going to debate with you where it is. I don't know. Somewhere in the Arabian Peninsula, we think. And if you could absolutely locate it, you could see Mount Sinai, look at it, touch it, take a picture of it. And that's what the author is talking about here, something physical that's earthly, contrasted to something that is also real, but it's in heaven, <clears throat> excuse me, and is physical and connected to spiritually. Okay? So let's go back, actually, to Exodus chapter 18 and read the account, or to Exodus 19. We'll read the account of it directly, just to get a fuller appreciation for what the author is referring to here. Exodus 19, and this is God's chosen people. Been, they've escaped slavery in Egypt. They've gone through the Red Sea. They're now in the wilderness, and they come to Sinai. And this is where God gave the law. It's the Ten Commandments were given here. And here's what happened. Exodus 19, 16. Came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And the chapter goes on in the chapter 20, and God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. Verse 18, chapter 20, verse 18. It says, Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking, and when the people saw it, they trembled, and stood afar off, and they said to Moses, You speak with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. 
And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near in the thick darkness, drew near the thick darkness where God was. Before we leave Exodus, Moses continued to give the people um, instruction on how to live their lives. And when he got all finished, you can turn to chapter 24. Um, When he got all finished, look at verse 3. Exodus 24, 3. This is important, connects later on to what we'll say. Exodus 24, 3. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said, we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain in 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Now here it is. Then he took the book of the covenant, which were the words that God had given him, and read them in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. All that he has said, we will obey. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you, according to all these words. Back to Hebrews. You would just flip back to Hebrews or scroll back to Hebrews, chapter 12. What's this have to do with me? What does this... Why does the author talk about Mount Sinai? It's when the the old covenant was given. A covenant that God made and initiated with his people. Why does Moses bring this up? And he he reminds them, you haven't come to Mount Sinai. That ship has sailed. We're in a new covenant The reason he tells them that is because they were drifting back toward their Jewish roots, which effectively would have put them back under the law. They were falling away from God's grace and wanting to put themselves back under a strict set of rules and regulations. We call that legalism. Ken Hughes says, few Christians are in danger of reverting to Judaism. Instead, we fabricate a series of mini Sinai's and mini laws that reflect nothing of the fiery presence and that are, we think, well within the reach of our unaided powers. It shrinks legalism. It shrinks spirituality to a series of wooden laws that says... If you will do these six or 60 or 600 things, you will be godly. And of course, legalism is always judgmental. How easily our hearts imagine that our lists elevate us while at the same time providing us with a convenient rack on which to stretch others in merciless judgment. Legalism kills unity. The Holy Spirit is who builds unity. Legalism is self-centered and judgmental. And there's no peace and there's no joy. And the Christian who gets caught in legalism, the Christian who gets caught in legalism says, I must do this to get right and or stay right with God. The Christian... Conversely, who is captured by the love of God says, I must do this because I love God and I want to please him. And the difference between those two is as broad and as wide as you can imagine. One is established on trusting in myself and the other is established on humbly believing and trusting in Jesus Christ. And it's our default nature 
It is our default nature. It's one of the greatest struggles that we have in our Christian life. Is try to make atonement for my own failures through, well, then I'm not going to eat ice cream anymore because that's just going to make me a better man. It might, temporarily, right? But it sounds funny, and we laugh a little bit, but it's, you know, we have all these deals that we cut with God rather than humbly come and confess our sin and say, please wash my feet again. I have screwed up so bad in thought, deed, or action. Or word, rather. Right? The Christian who is caught in legalism says, I must do this. Where the Christian who is captured by God's love says, I must do this because I love God, not because I have to. Twelve-year-old Jesus, sitting in the temple, misunderstood by his mom who knew where he came from, and, and because he had stayed behind and had not traveled with the family back to Nazareth, two or three days later, they realize they've lost the Son of God. They come back to Jerusalem. Mom and Dad, they're all anxious. They find Jesus in the temple arguing with the, the academics successfully. And they interrupt and they're like, Son, you've caused us a lot of trouble. What are you doing? Remember Jesus' words? Don't you know? I must be about my father's business. He was filled with the assurance and the confidence of God's approval and his love for him, made manifest at his baptism. This is my beloved son who I am well pleased, with whom I am well pleased, which means I have been pleased with him, I am pleased with him, I will always be pleased with him, is the, is the grammar there. And Jesus lived in that, and that compelled him to endure his race. And that's what the author is highlighting here. Don't revert to a system of legalism. It's death to your liberty, to your freedom. And you take too much upon yourself. And it grieves the Holy Spirit. And it's the battle that we fight all the time. Am I going to live by faith or am I going to live by my works? All that you have said, Moses... We will obey. They turned right around and made a golden calf and broke all the Ten Commandments in a heartbeat. John Bunyan in his Pilgrim's Progress, he highlights this very beautifully with his protagonist, Christian, right? Who's on his way to have a personal experience with Jesus Christ. And he set out on his journey. And it says, Christian turned out of his way to go to Mr. Legality's house for help. Mr. Legality's house for help. But behold, when he got near the hill on which the house was situated, it seemed so high in the side of it, in the side of the hill, that it was next to the wayside did hang so much over that Christian was afraid to venture any further, lest the hill should fall on his head. And thus he stood still and knew not what to do. Also, interesting, also his burden... And in Pilgrim's Progress, his burden is his sin and guilt. Also his burden, which was on his back, now seemed heavier on him than while he was in his way. There came also flashes of fire out of the hill. You see where Bunyan got this. That made Christian afraid that he should be burned. Therefore he did sweat and quake with fear and began to be sorry that he had come. I want to say one more thing about Mount Sinai. It was one of the most, what God did there in giving the law was one of the most gracious and loving things next to the cross that he had ever done. My opinion, which means nothing. It seems counterintuitive to say that. Because the descriptors there, it appears that God is angry and scary and intimidating, unapproachable and, and, approachable and life-threatening. It was an awesome physical sight and sound. But what happened at Mount Sinai is the law was given. And it was given for two reasons. That man would have the knowledge of their own sinfulness. And that is a step toward grace. And secondly, the law was our 
schoolmaster. It was our tutor. It was our pedagogue. It was our discipliner to lead us to Christ, as Paul would teach us. And so that was a very beautiful act, really, on God's part. But the author says, you haven't come there. You have not come to that mountain. When, when you and I, or when these people became Christians, the, they entered into a new covenant. A new covenant that fulfills the law on our behalf. Jesus came to fulfill the law. What's that great verse in Romans 10, 4? Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to all who believe. In other words, the law and Jesus are equal. They're both holy. They're both righteous. Jesus came and fulfilled the law. He did what none of us can ever or will ever do. So the, the, the foolishness of reverting back to a system of legalism to make ourselves or keep ourselves right with God needs to be turned away from. And these readers, were, were, they were falling prone to that. And so instead, he incentivizes them. And he says, no, 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 no. We aren't doing Sinai anymore. He says in verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of Jerusalem, or sorry, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. I want to, uh, I want to read that to you again. You are going to Mount Zion. doesn't say that, does it? He says, you will get to Mount Zion. He doesn't say that, does he? He makes a point, brothers and sisters. He says, you have come to Mount Zion. You have come. It's past action with continuous result, right? That's what it means. You're already there. You're already counted in the membership of heaven. You just haven't arrived yet, okay? You haven't literally physically gotten there, but you're, you're there, this is what Paul would mean when he tells us in Ephesians, we are raised up with Christ and seated with him in the heavenly places. Yes, I live here. My address is 1432 Hanshaw Road here in Ithaca. That is my place of residence. But that's my earthly place of residence. I have a place already established for me in heaven. I just haven't gotten there yet. It's mine. It's got my name on the door, I think. I don't know, Jesus, didn't he tell us? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you unto myself. These were the Lord's words to his disciples who were freaking out because they're just starting the Christian race and it met with a con conflict immediately. People started threatening Peter and John and James. And the Lord's like, remember the incentive. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I will come and I will take you to myself. You're going to heaven, brothers and sisters. And the author is reminding us of this so that we will take the next step and be obedient to the Lord out of a desire to please him. We're already there. We just haven't arrived yet. This is a language of Paul. Philippians 3.20, he says, Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I say to myself, and as I approach these next couple of verses where we'll spend the remainder of our brief time, what do we find when we get to heaven? What will we see? Now, if you want to go look at the size and shape and the construction of Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, then you can turn in your own time to Revelation 21, where it's descriptive to describe for us gates of pearl 1,500 miles high and wide and long. It's a cube, 1,500 miles in dimension, and, and so on and so forth. Streets of gold, and you know right? But he doesn't mention that here. 
the incentive that he's giving, the vision that he's giving, is he's sort of removing the veil and he's showing us, and by the way, this man is inspired by God himself. God has put these thoughts and these words into this man's life. They've come from heaven through this man's pen to touch your heart and mine today. As you're walking, as you're running your Christian race, or maybe you've gotten off track a bit, and you're beginning to question God's goodness. And this author is saying, get back on the road, straighten up, straighten out, and, and go forward. And so what does he reveal to us? It's, it's a beautiful thing. It, I, it flashed in my mind in studying that there was this amazing experience where in the life of Elisha, Elisha was given the ability to just sort of pull the veil away for his friend who was freaking out because they were surrounded by the Syrian army, 2 Kings chapter 6. And Elisha, he's just sitting back, got a toothpick, he's just picking his teeth. He's like, man, this is so amazing. Look at all those dudes. Like, dude, we're going to die. And, the guy, and his partner is like, he didn't have that same understanding. And the Lord, and Elisha prayed. And he said, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked, and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around the army. And I think this, what the Spirit of God is doing through this man is that in these three verses, he's revealing to us some of the most beautiful things in all of the Bible. Because it's our end. This is our finish line. This is where we're going. Isn't it good to know what the end is? Hopefully it will encourage you. In spite of the, the, the conflicts and the challenges that you're experiencing in your life, in whatever sort, Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. So what have we come to? We have come. I just want to repeat that to you. It's not that we're going to this wonderful place. Yes, I am literally going to this, this faith will put on sight. Yes. But the point is, I'm already enrolled there. I already have been given the authority to arrive there. And so what will I see? He shows us seven things. And the first thing is he says a heavenly Jerusalem. The heavenly Jerusalem. Seems weird, doesn't it? <laughs> that there's this massive city that's so big that's literally, according to Revelation, literally going to come down out of the heavens and plant itself back on this earth or on this earth. Right? So we've gone from the earthly Sinai to now to a heavenly, which is also physical in that it does literally exist, but we're connected to it now spiritually. And the sights and the sounds that are coming from this Mount Zion is much different than that of Sinai. So you've come to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem. All right, Mount Zion. Mount Zion is the name of the, the hill in the area that later became known as Jerusalem. David conquered that little place. And he brought the Ark of God into this little part of, uh, on top of Mount Zion. And then when David died, his son Solomon took over and he expanded the borders of the city of Jerusalem. And he built the temple on a different location and took the Ark and set it there. And it encompassed then what we call Mount Zion and slash Jerusalem. They're synonymous. It's free information in case you care. All right? So the first thing we come to is the city of the living God on Mount Zion. The second thing he reveals to us is an innumerable, innumerable company of angels that are having a party. It's an angel party. He says they're in festal assembly. What's that mean? Well, it means that they're having fun, that there's joy, there's merriment. That's what it means. It, it's the idea of, uh, in a Jewish context, that you would have these great festivals. One of the great festivals where they were often agricultural related. Like, so you had the Feast of First Fruits, where the first grains would be coming in and they'd have a big party. And then at the end of the season, the Feast of Thanksgiving. Uh, sorry, Tabernacles. We call it Thanksgiving. But it's very similar. 
and that the, the later harvest has come in, and, then, and God has provided for them. And so they just step back and give him thanks, and the Lord said, he actually put it into their rhythm of life. Every year, three times a year, I want you to remember your salvation. I want you to remember the first fruits and the Feast of Tabernacles. It was a wonderful experience, and they just would have a wonderful time for seven days, right? It's an angel party. That's what it says. They're in festal assembly. What are they so excited about? Well, we're not left to our imagination. Remember Luke 15? The woman lost the coin. The little parable before Jesus told the parable of the prodigal son, she lit a candle, searched high and low, finally found that precious coin that was so meaningful to her. And then she called all her friends, and she said, let's have a party. And then the Lord interpreted the parable. He said, there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner that repents. These people, these people, these angels are having a blast as they're standing here in, in heaven today. This is happening now while we're speaking, invisibly way up in paradise. There's this great worship of God, and then as they see the people who have, who have gone ahead of us, they're like, they're praising God, and there's just such joy. They're happy because we're happy. Angels are God's ministers. They're, they're projecting to us God's attitude towards those who have become Christians. That's what they are. They're carrying out His ministry. And the Lord would say there's more joy in the, or there's joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner that repents. So that's the second thing. He says, we also come to the church of the firstborn. What's that mean? Church of the firstborn. Near as I can tell, the author is referring to the rights and the benefits that belong to the firstborn, right? In, in that culture, the firstborn son was the one who was entitled to all the assets, all the belongings. He got the inheritance. The firstborn got all the stuff that his dad had. Right? And it says that the church of the firstborn, who are registered in heaven. Angels don't, angels have names, but they're not registered in heaven. Only humans have their name in heaven. And so the author is telling us that this church of the firstborn, he's saying, I believe that uh, the firstborn are those who are entitled to the inheritance the benefits and the blessings of the father. Again, I go back to the story of the prodigal son, who was the younger. The firstborn son, do you remember what Jesus said to the firstborn? All that I have is yours. That's what he said to him. It's hard to say all that I have without going like this. All right? And Jesus is actually saying that to the Pharisees. And I wonder if they remembered that Jesus said, all that I have is yours as they crucified him. He gave all that he has for them. And some of those Pharisees, many of those Pharisees became Christians, got their name enrolled in the register in heaven. This was the appeal this is the appeal, the incentive. Who are the firstborn? It's anyone and everyone who is born again. Man, woman, or child. It's not just the firstborn son. It's any Christian, it's any Christian of any background who is truly born again. Paul would say, if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Romans 8, 17. The next thing that, we, that he reveals to us is the curtain is pulled back. We've seen that we've come to, a, to the living God, to the city of the living God. We've seen that there's this angel party. And now we're told that there's the church of the firstborn, those who have gone ahead of us, who are registered in heaven. And then he says, to God the judge of all. To God the judge of all. What do I do with that? 
I think it was Ken Hughes who said it very simply. He said, it's joyous, but it's not casual. <laughs> because God is the judge. That same Jesus who we know so well from our Gospels came down on Mount, Zion, Mount Sinai. Okay? God is holy. And that is a serious, serious matter for you and I, sobering for you and I to consider. There's none righteous, no, not one. We have no business entering into his kingdom except through the blood of the Lamb. And so there's that sobriety, that, that sense that God is judge. But I will say, there's no indication that it sort of becomes a party pooper thing. <laughs> to me, it seems like the, the, the whole point I see in these three verses and the seven things that are revealed is that there's life. There's a living God and there's life. There's angel life and there's human life. And nobody is intimidated by the fact that God is the judge because he's for them. And so there's a sense of liberty. Yes, God is the judge, but they're free. They've been made right by the blood of the Lamb, and now they're in his presence, and it's just all glory to him. I have no business being with you who came down on Sinai, and yet here I am, and there's just a sense of freedom and liberty that they're experiencing. And then he says, the next thing we come to, I circled all the twos, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, the spirits of the righteous. So we've come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God. We've come to an angel party. We've come to uh, firstborn who are registered. We've come to God the judge, and now we come to the spirits of just men. I don't know why he separates them out. I'm not understanding exactly what the difference is between the church of the firstborn and the spirits of just men. But this I know. I know two things from that verse. First of all, I know that my mom and my dad, Tom and Barb Hathorn, are in heaven. Because that verse tells me that their spirit is in heaven, not their body. Their body, I stood at their gravesite not long ago. Their bodies are awaiting a resurrection. So where do you go when you die? You go into the presence of God. Jesus proved it with his last statement on the cross. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. The real you. The living you. The Im immaterial part that is, that is you. That it was designed and made by God. With all your beautiful nature and characteristics. That's who goes to heaven. His body went into a grave. He's the first fruit. And his resurrection guarantees that I will be resurrected, hopefully with something better than this. It really won't matter, but it's going to be amazing. It's the spirits of just men, those who have been made right by God's grace. That's the next thing we have revealed. If that verse doesn't once and for all settle the question, where do you go when you die? Is there... Is there a waiting room? <laughs> no, no. We follow in the path of our Savior. He went into the presence of God. In fact, he said it to the, uh, Jesus said it to the thief on the cross. Today, you'll be with me. Today. Before 6 o'clock comes, you and I are going to be in heaven. That's pretty cool. Now, that thief died, and Jesus died, and both their bodies were disposed of. And they're up in heaven going, ha ha, <laughs> we beat death. The next thing we come to is Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. There's one mediator between God and man. It's the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2.5. He's a mediator. He's a go-between. Whereas Job would say, I need somebody who can put their hand on God and their hand on me and just kind of be a go-between and make peace. Because there's this vast gulf separating this amazing holy God. Well, the answer is Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Right? And then the final, the seventh thing that he references is the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. 
And that's why I wanted to read in Exodus 24, because what sealed the deal for the people at Mount Sinai was Moses sprinkled blood, and it sort of ratified the covenant, right? And, and I believe that's what the author's saying, right? Jesus, the mediator, spilled his blood. It has, in type and spiritually, it's been sprinkled upon you and I. As soon as a sinner repents and trusts Christ and asks for him to accept them and forgive them, excuse me, then that new covenant is sprinkled on your heart and your mind. Speaks better things than that of Abel because Abel's blood cried out for vengeance. This isn't doing that. This is crying out and saying, you're forgiven. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. There's now no condemnation. Right? So in review, my friends, Hopefully this will encourage us in our Christian life. What have we come to? We've come to the city of God, an angel party, a privileged church, firstborn. God the judge, but not intimidated, no threat. Completed saints. Jesus the mediator, we'll see him face to face. When that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. And we've come to the covenant of grace and forgiveness. And so when I step back and I examine those things, I've alluded to it already, but what do we see? We see life, we see liberty, we see laughter, <laughs> there's joy, and we see love. Jesus exemplified love greater than any other example we have. That's a pretty good end. Where is this again? It's in heaven. Which means it's eternal. Which means the laughter and the love and the life and the liberty will never ever end. It's eternal. Love never fails. It will never disappoint. It will never, you'll call upon the demands that love is requiring of us to be patient and kind and not keeping a record of wrongs and to bear and to believe and endure all things. And you'll call upon Jesus, our mediator, and you're saying, I need a fresh dose from your spirit to walk again today. And he's well pleased with that kind of honest prayer. And he fills you again and you take another step. Keeping in front of us the end. An eternal home. The long home, as Solomon would say in Ecclesiastes. They've gone to their long home. <laughs> well, our long home is in heaven. A place where there's life and laughter. Just genuine, uproarious joy. And there's liberty, freedom of expression without being bothered by a sinful nature. It's, it's mind-boggling. But the Holy Spirit has inspired the writer to sort of let them see, Lord. Let them see what is ahead of them. It's an incentive. And so I want to say to you again, this is where you have come. That's what the author tells us. It's not you're going there. It's not you will get there. It's you're there. You just haven't departed yet. <laughs> so last week, as you know, uh, we married Alan and Tracy in Oregon, which required a flight. I don't like flying. Well, actually, I don't mind the experience of flying. It's just I don't like what it does to me because I get very anxious. Not about flying on an airplane. I, that's kind of fascinating what man has developed. It's just like, I got to get there. And so if it's an 11 o'clock departure, I want to be there at 5 in the morning. Just joking. But that's how, that's how I feel. And so when it gets to be, we're only two hours before departure, I'm anxious 
it never goes well. I'm just being honest with you. It goes well with my wife. If I'm traveling with Joni, she's poor thing. <laughs> I need to arrive early. <laughs> All right? So I'll just tell you, uh, in an illustration, you know, Joni and I flew to Portland, but Alan and Tracy bought our ticket. I didn't pay for it. They gave me a free ride over and back. But I'm anxious, right? 11 a.m. Syracuse, we got to be there. And so we leave. And for me, there's nothing better than getting through TSA and getting all my shoes and everything back on, right? And then getting to my gate of departure with a cup of coffee two hours ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I just chill out and I'm at rest. And I'm confident. Why? Because I have a boarding pass. And I know that my name is in the register and that that airline knows I'm getting on board. And so I get to my gate of departure to ply to board the plane and to fly away to my final destination. I'm essentially already there. I just haven't arrived yet. You know what I'm saying? So saints, your name written in heaven? Do you know where your final destination is? Do you have the boarding pass? <laughs> right? To convert my illustration? Is there such a thing? Is there some way that I can sort of be at rest in my Christian walk knowing that when the call comes for the time to depart out of this world and go to my final destination, just pull out that phone and scan it, baby. You're in. We got a seat for you. Is that a reality for you? There is such a reality, and that reality is called the Holy Spirit. Because when a, when, a, when a sinner repents and they come to Jesus humbly, our mediator, then he forgives all our sin and he gives us the Holy Spirit. And in all due, I don't want to sound irreverent, but the Holy Spirit is sort of our boarding pass. This is what Paul said. When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Amen. Are you going to heaven? Is this a reality for you? Maybe it is. Praise the Lord that it is that we're talking about angels and we're talking about God the judge and all these things are not strange to us. I'm familiar with him. I've heard his voice. I know him well enough to know that this is my end. And therefore, as, in, as long as the, as the run, my run, my course lasts, I'm going to keep this in my view. It's my incentive. You know, I volunteer because I want to at a local cemetery. And I spend a lot of time there taking care of the grass <laughs> and the weeds, right? I love it. I love taking ugly things and making them look good. And to be honest, I'm selfish and I love people going by and go, oh, man, that's a great job. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> I love that, <laughs> you know? But you know, my point is I'm around tombstones a lot. And you know what's interesting? There's always a little dash. There's a date. And then there's another date separated by a dash. Now, how long a period of time that is is already determined right there on that stone, right? You and I are in that dash right today. Where the other date comes, I don't know, but I got the boarding pass. It is the confidence of the Holy Spirit that he's given me. I'm going to chill out right here at this gate of departure. It doesn't mean I am in inactive, no, it means that I'm compelled by the love of God. 
to love my fellow man, to love one another. This is what I must do because I want to. Amen? Let's stand and pray. Lord, who could have thought this up? <laughs> I mean, really. You bring to our attention this morning in just this amazing way, this, this warning of legalism and this hope of heaven. It's just remarkable and beautiful. You are beautiful, Lord. We sang that repeatedly this morning, and justifiably so. You're beautiful in your nature. You're beautiful in the way that you deal with us. You are so wise. Lord, as challenging as life can be, we are now instructed that you're our Father. You're our Father. And yes, the, the things that are difficult, you're using them to weed out the stuff that slows us down in our race. Thank you, God. All glory to you. All glory to you, God. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for taking residence and, and doing all your, conveying to us all your love and your power. I pray that you would encourage your church today and this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Blessings to you.